Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, what I'd like to do, in light of the discussion this morning, I'm going to change uh, my talking points and my presentation a little bit to incorporate what some of the questions were that came up that we have not yet gotten to, but also to contextualize what some of the discussion was. So what I'd like to do is take us back up to the 50,000 or 30,000 foot view. The reason being is the federal government has an opportunity to really serve as an infrastructure um, for integration. And there are numerous pathways and ways in which we can address this. And in light of the discussion this morning, I want to talk about and try to create the continuum for us moving forward based upon where we've been. So this, the idea of integration and uh, health literacy is really not a new concept. We saw from um, the very first presentation, dating all the way back to the Guy's report, um, there was, uh, in the 1800s, actually dentistry was a specialty of medicine and some of the, um, some of the physicians taught it that way, but other faculties on the medical school uh, didn't agree, and it has separated since then, and we've talked about that. But what I'd like to do is, again, I'm going to start at the 50,000-foot level, and I want to talk about the HHS Oral Health Strategic Framework, because what this document and the effort behind it, what it represents is a number of efforts where the federal government and agencies within the Department of Health and Human Services and including parts of our um, Department of Defense or um, Coast Guard, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, along with the NIH and the CDC and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality of ARC and HRSA, gotten together and produced um, a report as well as the public health reports, which includes a perspective from the Surgeon General to lead the discussion around five different goals. And today I'm just going to talk about two of those goals, which is integrating oral health and primary care, the subject of this workshop, and then also the increase and the work in dissemination of oral health information to improve health literacy. So what I, what I have here is something that to me is a very useful map. And I want to use this just as an example to think about the, some of the questions that came up this morning. We have examples of best practices. We have discussion of environments where integration worked, whether it's medical providers um, applying fluoride varnish, or we talk about referrals. There's all these different examples, and we'll hear from our colleagues um, about examples in their environments, in their systems, where this works. But what this framework provides is a way to look at integrating oral health. So for example, the strategies are advancing interprofessional collaborative practice. It's stated right here, promoting education and training, which we talked about, whether it's in pre-professional um, or post-professional, shall we say, post-doctoral or post-degree uh, continuing education supporting policies and practices, all of these things are necessary in order to make integration really part of our paradigm shift, as, as Anita talked about earlier, and creating programs and supports to um, support innovations. What this crosswalk does is it gives a nod to what came before it. So as you can see, let's see if we actually do have the pointer here, this, okay. What this is referring to right here, IOM1 and IOM2, are the two IOM reports that were released in April and August of 2011. And these are, in fact, the recommendations from these two reports that reference back to integrating oral health and primary care. All the way over on the far right, is um, the Oral Health Coordinating Committee, or the OCC, OHCC, had a stakeholder meeting in 2012. And again, we're trying to roll this all up so that we have a framework to talk about the issues and not forget about 
all the good work and the important sentinel, both documents and workshops like this one that have come before. So if you weren't able to see it in the crosswalk um, slide, these are in fact the goal one strategies, the strategies to integrate oral health, and that includes, as I mentioned before, the interprofessional collaborative practice. I would like to point out this part here. All the efforts that I've been involved with have really been emphasizing the bi-directional, multi-directional. It's not taking oral health and dropping it into a medical environment. We have to be treating, if we need to practice what we preach, we need to actually embody the principles of integration. We need to be discussing the issues and working with these issues as integrated teams beyond when we get the wonderful opportunity to sit in an environment like this and share ideas. The other uh, goal that's specifically relevant to this conference is the increasing dissemination of oral health. There is a crosswalk for that as well. Once again, now you know what the IOM 1 and IOM 2 is referring to. Those are the two uh, oral health reports from 2011. But again, increasing the dissemination of oral health information and improving health literacy speaks to things like making the data and the science that we may know in the scientific or health community, making that relevant and digestible and usable by the public as well as the providers. This group, as we planned this activity, these are the strategies. We're very deliberate for the next two bullets, which is specifically improving the oral health literacy of health professionals, health professionals. But we were very cognizant and deliberate in the next bullet to improving the oral health literacy of patients, families, by developing appropriate messaging. Now, if you go to this document, this framework, what you will find is a plethora of examples from all the different federal agencies that participated in this, examples of each and every one of these strategies and goals. So if we take, for example, in goal four, the Administration for Community Living also includes the um, Administration on Aging. They had, in this document, they had proposed that they were going to undertake an oral health literacy and education effort to help older adults, caregivers, and communities, as well as health professionals. And what I'm happy to share with you, this is our um, oral health, HRSA oral health page, but this is a product that was in the framework, and now it has, in fact, come to fruition. And um, it's just recently been released. Each one of these is actually evidence-based um, health messaging that was driven by the public's need and their articulation, specifically for caregivers, saying, we need materials for older adults. We need it for us. We need to know how to do this because we are, in fact, in some cases, providing this service. We're actually with these older adults who have some um, difficulties in some cases on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'd like to now go from the 50,000 foot um, perspective down to the 30,000. So along in that framework are a number of those five goals, but integration has been a bedrock of HRSA's activities over many years. And what I have presented here for you are the strategic goals of the agency. Now, HRSA itself, um, the Health Resources and Services Administration, is sometimes considered the um, agency for access or the agency for the underserved. But in terms of our five goals itself, improving access to quality health services, strengthening the workforce, building healthy communities, improving health equity and strengthening our program management and operations. I wanted to just take a moment and hone in for you how important these issues are to the agency. So under goal one, improving the quality and efficacy of health care, I'm going to read for you, um, receive quality HRSA programs to provide care across the lifespan through comprehensive, integrated family-centered, patient-centered medical and health homes, increasing enrollment and utilization, disseminate, this is right from our own goals and strategies, 
disseminate culturally and linguistically appropriate information to educate not only our grantees and the professionals, but the public. Same thing with strengthening the workforce, support training and other activities that are culturally and linguistically appropriate, improving population health. Again, these themes of continued emphasis on oral health and emphasis on overall health is even built into the agency's goals. Now, we have done a lot over the last uh, six to eight years, um, specifically in this area of integrating oral health and primary care. And um, it relies upon the patient-centered interaction. HRSA does have strategic priorities. I will tell you that one that has continued since my time at HRSA um, is, in fact, integrating oral health and primary care has been a um, very important oral health priority. Just to, again, I think it's important for us to not keep reinventing the wheel and for us to keep talking about what has come before because we want to build upon the lessons learned and build upon the really good science and evidence that's out there already. So just to make you aware, um, we actually did have a contract with the uh, AAP and, in fact, to develop a curriculum which is, in, which is available on their EQIP um, platform to learn about oral health integration in primary care practices for children. If you're not a member of AAP and you want to go to the HRSA website, you can get this curriculum directly from um, the website as well. Again, this is considerations of oral health integration. Other areas, we spent an, a, an entire year plus working on an initiative to integrate oral health and primary care practice. There was a lot going on in the education community in terms of um, efforts, both the IPEC, which you had heard, heard referenced earlier, into professional education, but there was less going on at the practice interface. So we wanted to, as the federal convener, and um, as I said, to be able to serve as the infrastructure, we then circled back and took on the, uh, the charge of engaging at the practice environment. Part of this was, was spurred by those two IOM reports that actually made recommendations to the Department of Health and Human Services and specifically to HRSA to do what this slide says right here, which is create clinical competencies for non-dental providers, a way to not only re, um, reconnect and rejoin the mouth with the body, but also as any clinician or anyone who is interacting with patients, we need to not be looking straight past the oral cavity. And as dentists or oral health providers, we need to not be limited just to the oral cavity. So HRSA, um, through three different uh, large stakeholder meetings and listening sessions, uh, we created and promulgated the interprofessional oral health core clinical competencies. Very important to note, this is meant to be the minimal set. What is absolutely necessary to make a difference in the oral health and the overall health of the people that we're all treating? So this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. There are five domains, which are risk assessment, oral health evaluation, preventive interventions, communication and education, very important, and certainly interprofessional collaborative practice. So again, these are things that you can go to, you can use as um, reference points, but these are actually each of these um, documents and the actual content is being used in practice environments at a systems level, and we are testing this today. Um, just to show you from that whole initiative, we learned that there are multiple systems that come into play, and as the stakeholders and HRSA staff alike, that there were three areas that really rose to the top that are most critical in order to actually get to the implementation or the action level. It's great in theory, but if you can't put it into practice, we're not moving forward. And those are the actual healthcare system, the financing system, as was mentioned earlier, and professional associations. This is the actual report that has um, the core competency uh, in initiative described in it, as well as recommendations. Um, this has been used as a bedrock or a new benchmark for talking about integration and for moving into action. 
Um, one of the points, and these are excerpts from it that I did want to point out, is even in our four recommendations that the report has, specifically related to the topic we're talking today, the direction was that healthcare systems should engage and educate consumers about oral health in primary care as an expected standard of interprofessional practice. If the public who we're interfacing with, whether it's at a community level or individual level, if they come to understand and they come to value the fact that something going on in their mouth can be affecting the rest of the body, or the fact that if they take a pacifier or they take a spoon in their mouth and then give it to their child, what are the implications and the uh, impact of that or potential impact and the risks? And then also to evaluate the effectiveness and the application of the core clinical competencies in assessing patient satisfaction. Well, we've learned, it's very interesting, that when the medical team asks the patient about their gums bleeding or do they have problems chewing or do they have pain, they suddenly go, oh, why are you asking that? And as my colleague across the hall from me at HRSA he says, he says, I ask every single one of my patients, he's a primary care doc, he says, I ask every single one of my patients this. He says, it's my opportunity just to teach them that their mouth is connected and that the, all the systems are connected. So we talk about developing an interoperable and accessible system. This came up this morning. I was glad that I, I had the foresight to make sure that I had a slide calling out the recommendations for payment uh, modifications and incentives to address uh, the challenges that were mentioned this morning. But in particular, one part that I wanted to call out, was, call out was building of partnerships and coalitions to educate, this did not come up this morning, policymakers, legislators. Um, this is, they're an important part of the team, as well as the public, um, about the benefits of integration. And I know that um, colleagues and, and the speakers this morning talked as well about you know, can the public be the drivers of change? There's many examples where they have been, and perhaps this is one that that oral health literacy or health literacy can really drive the change. Um, I did want to just point out to you that HRSA has continued investing in this area. We have three different projects that thankfully we have funding we were able to put out the door. The first one was the testing of these competencies in health centers, and this is actually an, an implementation guide that's available in our cooperative agreement, the National Network for Oral Health Access website. But brand new, so that was one year um, of funding. They tested at several uh, health centers. We learned a lot from that, but then we were able to provide um, new projects, again, now not only taking it at pilot testing level, but now to demonstration projects. And now our newest funding is going now at a state level. How do we disseminate this? How do we test the generalizability of these principles? And what are the common, um, common factors that are needed to implement? So I wanted to share that with you. And if it looks like I have just a few more minutes, right? Um, I do want to share with you, again, many people don't know about this. This is from HRSA's website. We actually have a web page um, and a whole section. We have an Office of Health Equity. And just to speak about, again, Cultural competency is different than, uh, than health literacy, but they do go hand in hand. Um, this is the website. I did want to point out as well that HRSA has materials and we have uh, webinars and we have resources across our whole agency. Oral health doesn't sit in one part of HRSA. It goes across our entire agency. It's in maternal child health. It's in the HIV AIDS Bureau, it's in the Health Center program, it's everywhere. These are available for anybody, it's for the public, it's for you all, it's for your legislators. Feel free to use these, but what I'd like to do is literally just take one minute, hopefully this will work, and nope, it didn't work. Is there any way you can go back one slide and activate that video? Nope, won't work, okay, all right. Um, anyhow, there's a very nice uh, uh, video about uh, health literacy, and I love just the first uh, 45, to, 45 to 60 seconds of it because it really drives the point home for me is, um, you know, what we say to a patient and how we say it really doesn't always relate to what they hear. And I think the example here is a very nice one, so I encourage um, everyone to go there. 
Um, I do want to also point out, again, in thinking about this, how far we've come, very often I know that I get, I'm so excited about and passionate about this idea of integration and interprofessional practice. It's the way I was trained. It's the way that I personally practice in my clinical environment. But sometimes we forget about all the hard work that's been done before. So I want to very quickly show you just some things that are already out there that might have relevance for you. So HRSA has advisory committees. And I just wanted to point out that this is the most recent one um, here on your left, um, addressing social determinants of health and the role. Um, for example, from that report, uh, students need to develop cultural competency and the ability to provide services that respect health beliefs and practices of the communities they serve, along with cultural humility and a commitment to address the power imbalance implicit in the provider-patient relationship. But it goes on to also talk about the things that were brought up this morning, which is failure to address socio-cultural socio differences often results in poorer health outcomes and lower quality of life. So although oral health literacy um, and integration is not the topic for this, it is perfused in many of these reports. The one on the right is, in fact, health literacy and patient engagement. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, these are, again, from different advisory committees, uh, transforming interprofessional health education and practice, moving learners from campus to the community to improve population health, incorporating interprofessional education. You get where I'm going, but I did want to put this up here to show you this is just a snapshot of a huge universe of relevant and important findings that we should not go back and reinvent the wheel. Two more, again, from our advisory committee on medicine and dentistry, interprofessional education, very timely, very relevant for this discussion. And I, I particularly wanted to call this one out. Um, this is going back to 2010, and this is the advisory committee on interdisciplinary community-based linkages. And the importance of providing interprofessional education and training for all healthcare providers to effectively address health behavior change at the individual, family, community, and policy levels. Isn't that what we talked about this morning? How do we affect change? Individual health behaviors significantly affect the development and outcome of chronic diseases. Dental caries is one of them. I think we all agreed to that this morning, which have far surpassed infectious diseases as leading causes of death and disability in the US. So again, think outside the box. Sometimes it's not your dental journal or your medical journal or your nursing journal. Sometimes it is a community health or a local newspaper that you might find the opportunities and the areas for um, making inroads in health literacy. Again, just a resource, I want to let you know, we talked about education. We talked about continuing education this morning. Um, this is HHS's uh, Office of Minority Health developed a wonderful curriculum on cultural competency. It does come with continuing education credits. Um, there's a number of different ones. There's one, this is the one I highlighted here, but there are others. Uh, this is for oral health providers. Um, I did want to also tell you that during the morning session, speaking again to this continuing education, is I got an email reminding me that um, a, we just a year and a half or so ago, maybe two years ago, um, we did a webinar on integrating oral health and behavioral health in primary care. Um, again, this is still available to, to professionals, to the public. We really worked very hard to engage the social work community. But in particular, what I wanted to tell you also is we just this past week, um, continue education, advancing oral and primary health care integration to support diabetes prevention and management. The one that's coming up um, in two weeks is advancing oral health and primary care integration to support people living with HIV. So these are things that I can tell you at least HRSA and other parts of HHS are undertaking to move ahead in our pathways to integration. And so my takeaway message is that we need to continue to build upon the solid, solid foundation. What's come before, like our ancestors on this topic, right? Um, we need to build upon what currently exists. We, need, we have to be connecting all professions and caregivers, 
communities and individuals to look to ensure that we employ appropriately crafted messages and we move towards fully integrated models of care and not keep reinventing the wheel. Um, our health and that of the communities we serve and those in those communities where we live all depend upon it. Thank you very much.